When I get my civic clothes on, oh, how happy I will be. The first thing you see when you come into the park is this. The Newfoundland Regiment, which was a new young regiment of 752 um, kids at the age of 19, 20, 21, was part of the 29th Division. And every division has got its own badge. And the badge of the 29th was a red triangle. So the first thing you see here, symbolically, is the flash of the 29th Division, the fighting 29th. Now, every country has got its own symbol. The caribou is the symbol of Newfoundland because there are so many caribous in Newfoundland. The caribou is overlooking the battlefield. At the moment, you don't know the symbolism of that face. It's only when we come back and you look at it again that you will appreciate what it's all about. The whole way that it's been set up and um, the way that the governments gave the land to Canada and everything, it's really symbolic and it shows a great deal of respect to the men that gave their lives. You are actually standing in the second line of the British trenches. Major General DeLeo decided to send you into battle secondly because he wanted the older soldiers, the more experienced ones, to go in as part of what was called the first wave. And it was the soldiers of the Essex Regiment that were going to lead the attack. Their orders were to go down the communication trench, into the front line and over the top from the front line. You're all bunched up together in these narrow trenches. So some of you go down the communication trenches, but the rest of you can't be bothered waiting. So you go over, and the second that you put your heads up to go over the top, the German machine guns da -da 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 -da, get you. By the time you get here, it's taken you 10 minutes to get over the parapet and through all the barbed wire that was here. Remember, all this was thick with barbed wire. You're also carrying heavy equipment and you've been told to walk. When you get here, you realise that it's actually going to be quite easy to get across this trench because the frontline trench is filled with the dead and dying of the Essex Regiment. Because as soon as they had put their heads up, the German machine guns got them and they fell back down into the trench, filling the trench up with their bodies. And you have got to go over the top. Now, you can't pick your way through, you have to stand in them because you've got to go over quickly. So many of them are dead, but some are still gravely wounded. Can you imagine the horror of that? Walking on these injured men with blood pouring out their body from machine gun bullets. I feel the way the story was told to us um, definitely put us in the place of the soldiers and definitely got us to feel a little hint of what they were feeling, but I don't think it would compare at all to how they were. must have been feeling, they must have been absolutely terrified. I was very impressed by the fact that they were brave enough to go over the top into the obvious death, basically. Uh, I don't think I personally could have done it. Now you might say, well, why did you not run away? Why did you not jump into the shell holes? There's a few reasons for that. Part of the business of being trained as a soldier for a year and a half is to instill into you military discipline so you don't run away in the face of gunfire. Soldiers are told always to obey their last order. And the last order you had was to attack and to walk to the Germans. So you do what you're told. That's what military discipline is about. The orders couldn't be changed because most of the officers are already dead and injured. Even the officers that are surviving can't change the orders anyway. Telephone communications in those days were field telephones connected by metal wire. When the shelling went up, these lines were broken. So the generals away behind the line didn't know what was happening in the front. If the generals behind the line knew, of course they would have changed the line. They wouldn't have sent men to their death, but they didn't know because the lines of communication were broken and they did not have mobile phones. We had the technology to kill each other in large numbers. We did not have the technology to communicate. Like you learn like how it would have been for the soldiers to like be in the trench and having to go up out and how far away the Germans were. You just you feel like like you're in it. 
on the battlefield you can really tell something happened here because of all the shell holes it doesn't look like a normal field it's really just quite depressing and kind of astonishing that so many people died in such a small area of the 752 of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment that went into at battle at quarter to eight on the 1st of July 1916, 684 were killed. Now, in any battle, you expect to have 10% casualties. If it's a bad battle, 20%. If it's a real bad battle, 30%. If it's a disaster, 40%. There has never been a battle in history, to this point, when you had 50% casualties. On the 1st of July 1916, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment suffered 91% casualties. In terms of proportion, if all of you had attacked this morning, two of you would be left alive. Imagine the coach goes back to Bishop Briggs Academy and all your friends and family are standing waiting to meet you and two of you come out the coach. Can you imagine the grief, the incredulity? That is exactly what happened to the families in Newfoundland. They lost almost all their young men within 40 minutes. The attacks continued for the next three, four months. And so the dead soldiers lying out here rotted. There was further explosions, so some of the bodies were blown to bits never seen again. The rest just rotted into the ground or lay on top of it. On the 14th of November, the day after the front line was captured here, Captain Hunter gave orders that the remains of the dead should be collected. And so he sent uh, work parties of soldiers to collect the dead bodies. And as they went in to the area that you have just walked over and lifted the corpses, the flesh simply slipped off the arms and the legs. It was like rotting cheese. But worse than that, as they went among the bodies to lift them, the whole place became alive with a sea of rats that had been embedded in the boys' bodies. And so they come out screaming and yelling. You can imagine size of cats running. It was a vision from hell. That's what it was like. So the remains of some of them were taken and buried in the battlefield. Up until now, you have seen these cemeteries. Now, for the first time, you're going to go in to your first battlefield cemetery. So here's the cross of sacrifice. And in the center of it at the top, there is a bronze sword, the sword of justice, what the young men were fighting for. All the Soldiers are buried under Portland stone slabs, rectangular in shape, carved at the top, and with the badge of the regiment on it. When we visited Wai Ravine Cemetery, it was really emotional. Not at the beginning, but after we realised how many graves there were, I think, it just sort of hit us. Sometimes you had a couple of uh, bodies put into the same grave, and the bodies have rotted together, and the skeletons have mixed up. So when the Commonwealth War Graves pe Commission people come to bury the properly, they dig them up and they can't separate the bodies. So don't try. They simply put them both in the same coffin and bury them in the same grave exactly as they were. Now in this case, we know one of the lads, his name was Private G. Warford. He was actually in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and he was killed on the 1st of July 1916, aged 22 years of age. And his mother put the inscription on the bottom, gone but not forgotten by a mother. May his soul rest in peace. But also, Private Warford's body has mixed up with another soldier, an unknown soldier, who is known unto God, but not to us. The first cemetery we were in, in Newfoundland Park, was very emotional. It really hit home about what sacrifices they'd given and how much how many had died. Uh, the most emotional ones were the ones that didn't know the names, as they just, it was very sad. Seeing the graves that say an unknown soldier, that's kind of the worst bit because you just think, you know, like the families don't know where they are. and Some of the bodies, they didn't even know where they were. They just guessed that they were around there and put a gravestone. Just walking through them, seeing all the names and some of them didn't even have them. So it's quite upsetting the fact that you don't know who they are. 
Um, when we went to the 51st Highland Division, I felt kind of proud to see that there was something there that represented Scotland. And it was basically this big monument of a man in a kilt looking over the battlefield again. The Scots were being recognised for what they did um, during the war. To be able to stand there and, and see it, like the memorial that's been given to us, was, was amazing. It made me very proud to be Scottish because it showed how much respect they had for us as they gave us a space in the Newfoundland Park. If you look at the names, you'll see there's another terrible story into all of this. Connors, Connors, Connors. Evans, Evans, Evans. Tell me, can you imagine if the telegram came to your parents to tell them that all your brothers had been killed? That's what happened here. An entire generation of young men were wiped out and as a result, there were no children made. Newfoundland never recovered from the loss of its young population. Even to this day, the population is lower than other parts of the country. The caribou is mourning her lost generation, howling in grief.